wow, my, my earliest memory of Whitney Houston was being in high school, watching her sing on The Tonight Show. Whitney Houston, for me, has always been a part of my life. I'm an 80s baby from New York City, so Whitney is a hometown hero. I remember the first time that I saw Whitney Houston, I really honestly felt like I saw myself in her. She's a brown girl, she had natural hair, she was feisty. My earliest memory of Whitney Houston was The Bodyguard. The music, just her poise, beauty, femininity, talent, but her voice. I feel like I know her even before I met her because of you know, saving all my love for you, all at once, greatest love of all. The first, the first two or three albums that really introduced to the world as, as kind of our Black American princess. When I heard you give good love, I felt like there was this young, new voice that was passionately singing R and B at the same level as some of the greats that we knew uh, at the time, the Patti LaBelle's and the Shaka's and all that. She had this huge voice and she was definitely delivering something that was different. It was a different sound. I Will Always Love You is one of the most vocally precise and not just precise in a way that she's hitting every single note. It's the way that her voice tells the story. Why does it hurt so bad? Huh. The way she sings the song when she says, that I, I find myself right back in love with you. Why does it hurt so bad? That line to me is just, uh. She expressed these real life situations that were so relatable in such a, a beautiful way. I think that her voice allowed for her to, to be vulnerable and tell stories and love that weren't often told from a black woman's perspective. Like it wasn't just, oh, she's famous and we know and there's a couple cool memes and some songs. Like she was the conversation. There was no black woman like her in the, in, in, the, in the world at that point presented to us. It was like Claire Huxtable and Wendy Houston. Just showing herself and how multifaceted she is as a woman, how we all are as women, how sometimes you genuinely can be going through a heartbreak, like Heartbreak Hotel. Sometimes you might be in a situation where you're in love with someone who's in love with someone else. Or sometimes you're in a situation where you're spreading love to the next generation. Interesting enough, the amazing Clive Davis, I had a meeting with him set up and he immediately was like, we want you to be a part of the Arista family. Now, when he said that to me, all I could think of was, wow, I could be like a male version of Whitney Houston. <laughs> it was quite, quite overwhelming. And, uh, but the most validating thing ever was, you know, hanging out with her later and getting that, oh my God, you can sing, you can sing. And I'm thinking, Whitney Houston <laughs> is talking to me, talking about I can sing. I'm like, whoa, you're the queen, you know. I'll never forget, we were in a studio in Atlanta and it was a studio that she had worked in before. And uh, there was a poster of her or a plaque on the wall outside and she's standing by the poster. And she's staring at it. So I said, what are you looking at? And she said, um, I honestly don't remember taking this photo. And it was obviously during a time when she wasn't in her best health. But then she pointed at the photo and she said, well, this reminds me to always make light music. L-I-G-H-T, light music. She's like, the world needs a lot, needs more light music, the world, the world needs hope, the world needs songs to remember to fall in love and to forgive. And that's what I'm about. And then she's like, all right, let's go back in and finish our songs. Because it kind of reinvigorated her to get our songs done because she considered those light music. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten as a creator and as a songwriter and as an artist that my job is to uh, not create more confusion, but to add some solutions and some light to the world. While wow, Whitney's legacy shows up even in today's music, in, you know, the Ariana Grande, the Jasmine Sullivan, you know, the, the Demi Lovato's, like these powerhouse voices, you can just tell. I see in a lot of other artists, the runs. Whitney's run, oh man, she would do the cleanest runs. <laughs> but in terms of in the business, there's a lot of ways in which she was instrumental. Obviously, as she broke records and sold out tours and all that stuff, those were things that were changing the game and making a lot of room and access for black artists, especially black women. And we see that, I mean, there's 
Brandy and, and Mary and Mariah and, and, and uplifting and empowering black women. I saw it because of her. Whitney has always been a woman who has walked in who she is, stood firm in who she is. Her confidence came into the room before her. And I think that those are, those are the things for me that, that make her such a huge influence. Obviously it's the voice first, but it takes a lot more than just having a good voice, as we know, to really etch yourself in history. We that are a part of the industry know that our talent is probably 20% of what actually allows you to become a star. The rest of it is understanding your brand and who you are. Um, but with the genius of Clive Davis and the sound of her voice, they had a combination where they were able to do what we call pop music. Sometimes Whitney Houston was criticized because of it. But as a business person, she had to make a decision that I'm going to go with this particular song because it's going to catapult my brand to the stratosphere, which it did. In spite of um, the criticism, uh, I know that she endured. I also think about how instrumental she was with um, the production she was a part of, not just in music, but in movies. Like, I uh, think about how instrumental she was with casting Brandy in Cinderella and giving another black woman, a young black woman, a shot, and how diverse that, that she was, I mean, she was part of the production company that did the movie, not just the hired help. The Bodyguard changed my life because it was one of the first times that I saw a black woman able to take up so much space in so many different lanes. You know, that I could exist in so many different spaces the way that Whitney did. Wayne Tex Hill, the movie, but also the soundtrack, which was, was, was a business plan. And the idea that she could have done that whole movie by herself, soundtrack wise by herself, and had this brilliant business idea to loop in Babyface and, and the record label. Let's go all the way back to when BB and CeCe Winans came out. She was so, willing to share that that gift with BB and CC and was like if we do this together all of my audience is going to see this as well as your audience and they had humongous hits together and they were on the Arsenio Hall and a lot of TV shows those tonight show kind of shows all the time which was unheard of for gospel I think that was one of the first times that I saw Whitney Houston as a person who was aware of her power as an artist but all those things are not by accident those are things that um, a really intelligent, astute, uh, driven businesswoman um, chose to do and then decided to get behind the mic and sing and be the best damn singer to do it as well. I remember being maybe nine or 10 years old and I would put on um, really any Whitney records, but my favorite song was I want to dance with somebody and I would dance around my room with a hairbrush or a curling iron like I was performing that song on stage and oh I don't want to get emotional just pretending just channeling her in in those moments preparing and wishing and planning for my own career I don't think we realize that the idea of a black pop star um, was foreign before her and her family's legacy, really. I mean, Dionne Warwick, who's her cousin, was essentially the first black female pop star, you know, in, in the way we the way we define it now. Chart topping records, beauty, touring, um, the idea of quote unquote crossing over, um, whatever the hell that means now, but the idea of crossing over back then really meant to get approval from white audiences, to make money that white artists were making that we weren't allowed to make. She took it to the next level with beauty and fashion and number one records, but you don't get a Beyonce, you don't get a Brandy, you don't get a Monica, you don't get any other uh, Jessie J and, um, and Christina Aguilera, and the list goes on and on and on and on. It, I don't know, it, it makes me emotional, I think, because I, I just think about how I don't, I don't even know if she knew, maybe she did, I don't know if she knew just by being who she was and walking in who she was and and even coming from the church I came from the church as well it's she she told me who I could be but Whitney Houston single-handedly created a lane a different lane a new lane for black musicians and she caught a lot of flack 
court in the ways that I think in retrospect were grossly unfair, um, really small minded and kind of cringeworthy. But that's kind of comes with the, with the responsibility of being a trailblazer. You kind of have to blaze a trail and, and catch all the heat for it. Um, which kind of angers me when I look back on it now because she, I don't think she was treated fairly during, in her lifetime. But I'm praying that with interviews like this and with more conversation as some of the salacious stuff fades, we'll get back to the greatness that she was because she, she really was one of a kind and there's a lot of opportunity that happened after her that could not have happened had she not done what she did. I think especially in that time before social media, there was all this artist development and artist training where a lot of times labels would suppress all that you are to have yourself presented in a very specific way. And I think her ability, her inability to take up all of the space that you could tell that she wanted to, like what we were saying earlier, like her sense of humor or her playfulness. I heard coming from Jersey, you know, there were so many parts of herself that made her the girl next door for black women that they totally suppressed and wanted to paint this clean, perfect image that's difficult for anybody to live up to. Being as famous as she was doesn't give you minutes of peace. It doesn't allow you to um, just exist like everyone else. What I got from her was beyond her faith, which I think faith really was the grounding force for her, her belief in God, her trust in God, and the fact that she believed that God loved her in a special way. I think it really mattered to her to be a good human first before a singer. I think the world took her as a singer first and then judged her humanity afterwards, but really she was a lady that loved God and loved to sing. It's unfortunate that this industry didn't allow Whitney Houston to take up all the space because I feel like if she could, it would have been a completely different story. I will always love Whitney Houston and the world will also love her for her generosity of her gift, for the beauty she exuded, not just on record, but on screen, um, for the millions of memories that are attached to um, her songs, graduations, marriages, um, first dates, uh, first dances, um, the first time you had the courage to ask somebody out, all those things, Whitney Houston's playing in all those places. She's the storyteller of our generation and the soundtrack of, of our love lives. And, and it's told through this incredible flawless vessel that is timeless and, and beautiful. And I think her life in totality is a cautionary tale, not just, I think we like to say her life is a cautionary tale about drugs and fame, but no, it's a cautionary tale for us on how we treat people, right? How we um, love them, hate them, and then, re and then live in regret once they're gone, as opposed to loving them all the way through. I also think it's a cautionary tale about acceptance because um, as truth would have it, imagine what, Imagine where she would be had she been allowed to live and love freely. That blows my mind that artists now, today, to be open about your sexuality, to today, to be open about who you love, to be dating the bad boy, to be even using drugs and clubbing would actually catapult your career in most ways, unfortunately. And those are the things that we crucified her for who she loved, who she married, who we wanted her to marry, who we thought she deserved. Um, all those things now make me cringe because even myself, we all were kind of complicit in ways we bought into the into the salacious tales and the gossip mag in ways that were harmful to her as a, as a real person. And I hope that we learn from that, even though she's not here to reap the benefits. I hope we learn from that now and in the future. We remember to treat people with a little more empathy and love. And even to this day, the fact that we're doing this is because she's been so poorly defined in the press and even in the black community, if I'm keeping it real, I think we've been unfair to her in ways that I think she deserved for as much as she gave. So it's, it's a lesson for me personally. Not, it's not even, I'm not on a soapbox, I'm preaching, I'm talking to me. It's a lesson to do better. Or in her words, it wasn't right, but it's okay because we're doing, we're learning now.